Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Good morning. Welcome to worship this third weekend in Lent, this season of preparation. And we are glad to be gathered together today. And our focus today will be on our Old Testament reading and God's giving of the Ten Commandments and the framework or context that God calls upon to give him permission or authority to give commandments. We're going to talk about that today and how an impact that might have on us. I want to welcome to worship Pastor Kip and Sue. Uh, it was so good to see you today. I'm glad to have you guys visiting with us again today and that you're back on your feet. We've prayed for you a long time and we're glad to see you uh, here with us today. I want to also just uh, give praise to God uh, this weekend, last night. We had a baptism with uh, Barrett Bellina, the son of uh, Trevor and Haley Bellina, added to the family of God through baptism. And so we'll be praying for him today, and uh, we thank God for that blessing as well. We do have communion today, and so I invite you to make sure you have a cup from uh, the communion table back there in the back of the sanctuary. If you didn't grab one, go ahead and make sure you grab one of those this morning. I think that prepares us for worship today. We uh, will begin with our first hymn. Please rise. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
from the rising of the sun to its setting. May the Lord be gracious. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, I have sinned in thought, word, and deed. By my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me and forgive me all my sins and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and in life after night. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you forgiveness and remission of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the rising of the sun to its setting. May the Lord be gracious. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. reading that greets us this morning is from Exodus, the 20th chapter. 
And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself the car carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven or above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is in your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle that greets us this third Sunday is from Paul's first letter to the church of Corinth, the first chapter. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. I'm sorry, you should be seated. Let me start that over. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart where there is one who is wise, where there is a scribe, where there is the debater of this age. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For, in since, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, and not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that human being, no human being might boast to us in wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification, redemption, so that it is as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For this is the word of the Lord. Now you may rise again for the holy reading of the Holy Gospel, the Lord's Prayer and the Creed. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple and found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body, when therefore he was raised from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture 
and the word that Jesus has spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He delivered delivered for our sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. We confess together the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as you give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here ends our sermon text. Grace, mercy, and peace from our God and Father, and our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I am going to give a brief moment of parenting advice. Not necessarily from my years of experience, but from other sources of wisdom. I'm especially going to talk for a moment to fathers like myself. What not to say. Don't, no, I'm going to say don't ever say this. It may be fitting and maybe you have and that's quite all right. But don't ever say, as long as you're living under my roof... Now, let's be honest. How many have have, uh, said or heard that said to them in their lives, right? As long as you're living under my roof. And now, let's be honest. Has that ever then um, preceded a very positive parent-child interaction? Has that ever, you know, been said right before there was a a big kind of uh, seventh heaven kind of moment where there were lots of hugs and smiles and, you know, very cheerful family dinner? Did that ever happen right after a parent said, as long as you're living under my roof? It didn't, right? None of us honestly can say that whenever a parent said those words, there was a very positive interaction afterwards. 
Usually, the best we hope for when that happens is that the teenager, because it's usually said to a teenager, right? Well, the, the, the teenager who hears those words will slam down whatever's in their hand, and if nothing's in their hand, they will kick their foot or stomp their foot. They will storm off to a room and slam the door. That's usually how that ends, at best. At worst, who knows, right? As long as you're living under my roof, it never works out too well. Imagine if that were the context for the Ten Commandments. Couldn't it be? Couldn't God simply say, as long as you're living on my earth, here are the rules. And what do we do whenever we interact with God's law? Sometimes the very best we offer back to God is stomping our feet, slamming down our hands, storming into the next room and slamming the door. Isn't that a common response? I mean, God could do it that way, right? As long as you're living on my earth, you will have no other gods. Right, watch me, says every rebellious sinner. As long as you're living on my earth. And we kind of just come to the point like most teenagers do and say to God, whatever. It's kind of the reaction I see whenever I'm teaching the second commandment to my confirmation class, which is usually filled with a significant number of basketball players who occasionally miss layups. I miss layups too, let's be honest. I'm not the greatest basketball player or the greatest anything for that matter, but I miss a lot of layups. And what happens often when teenage kids miss layups? They start praying or something else with God's name. I'm not too sure it's often a prayer. And so I talk about, you know, hey, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, almost as if God were saying, as long as you're living on my earth, you better not be taking my name. And even before I'm finished with a lesson, just as many of us, before we're even finished hearing that whole commandment, we're like, eh, God, you're so outdated. God, you're so not in touch with the modern times. God, you're so, just, that's not even what it means anymore. We do that with a whole bunch of the laws, don't we? Right? Whenever we talk about thou shalt not commit adultery and we start talking about the rules about human sexuality and marriage and whether or not living together before marriage is an okay thing and the church is Kind of, hey, it's not, not a great idea. It's really frowned upon. And we start after eventually going, well, God, you don't know what you're talking about anymore. That's not how it even works in the 21st century. And God's there, as long as you're living on my earth, right? Well, I want you to think today again, back to the Ten Commandments that we read twice now. But from our uh, Old Testament lesson from Exodus chapter 20, what God says right before he launches into the commandments. And I want you to recognize what God claims as the authority he has for giving these commandments. He could have said, as long as you're living on my earth, and went from there because he is the owner of all things. He could have even said, since I created everything that exists, including you, I made you and I can take you out. Another great thing, parents, you probably shouldn't say. He could have said that. He could have claimed, you know, hey, I am the only God because the definition of God, one of them is created all things that exist. So listen to me. He could have done that way. But notice what he chooses to fall back on. What he chooses to ident use to identify himself to Moses and to Israel. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, who delivered you from slavery. That's what he wants his children to remember as they think about his law. 
Why is that significant? You could answer it this way. Here are my laws, children. Now, which other God has delivered you from slavery? Which other God's rules do you find better? And start with a list of gods who have delivered you from captivity, who have delivered you from your prison, who have delivered you from your suffering, who have answered when you called out because of your taskmasters. What other gods have heard you when you cried for help and delivered you? What other gods are you going to follow? I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now here are my Ten Commandments. It's a whole different perspective, isn't it? God who starts with his gift of deliverance. God who chooses to outline these commandments from his gift of forgiveness already given. You see, we don't work that way. We look for the the loopholes for how to get around the law and how to ignore the law, how to to call the lawgiver crazy, how to, to get ourselves out from under the burdens of those laws. And here our God is saying, I am the God who delivers you. Won't you listen to me? The Apostle Paul in Romans and For those of you who have been reading along in our our weekly or daily readings, the the book of Romans we just finished, and we talked about in Romans how the first half of the book of Romans is God unveiling more and more the process of salvation, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all the wages of sin is death. God has kind of clearly unveiled that for us over and over again throughout the first about half or so of the book of Romans. And then there's this big hook or big turn. We get to Romans chapter 12. There's a therefore, and I talk about that therefore a lot because that therefore in Romans 12 is extremely important. Therefore, because of all these great things God has done, not only has he told us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but also all are justified freely by his grace. Not only has he told us the wages of sin is death, he's also told us the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He's told us we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He has told us over and over again of our salvation in Jesus, how he has delivered us from sin and death and the power of the devil. Therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be changed. Be different. Because of God's grace given to you. Because of God's love shown to you. Because of God's gift for you. Because of God's deliverance for you. Because of the relationship that God has established with you. Be changed. Be different. That's the context of the law, the, especially for us in our Lutheran background. We talk about the third use of the law. That's what we're talking about. It's because God has redeemed and delivered us, now his law is not burdensome for us. It's God's desire and direction for you and for me. Not because he's angry, because he hates us, because he loves us. His law comes from that relationship. William Gurglio, in his book, uh, Tales of a Stepfather's Love, tells the story about a young man who, when he was, he had been a, a child of a single mother until he was 13. When he was 13, his mom married and, and he got a stepdad. You can imagine what this teenager's life was like under a stepdad. You probably know that relationship already strained in a nuclear family between father and son is even more strained between a stepfather and a stepson. And then when this kid was 16, his mom was killed in an accident and his stepdad raised him. And the relationship got worse. The stepfather did everything he could for his son. He took care of his needs. He fed him. He clothed him. He kept a roof over his head, and he tried to provide for him. But this teen was a rebellious teen, and at the age of 18, he got into some serious trouble. 
He was out, uh, he had stormed out of the house after yelling at his stepdad and out around town he made a few poor choices. When the father, when the stepfather got the phone call to come and see his son in the county jail, he was there, the car was wrecked, another boy was dead. And the stepfather showed up at the jail and the stepson sitting there just waiting for the worst of the worst. Stepdad comes in, pays the, the bail money now, gets him out, brings him home. They get home. The whole ride home was silent. Nothing was said. And now the stepson's just anxious, waiting for the hammer to fall on him. They get in the house. And the stepdad puts his keys down, tells his son, good night. Starts like his head into bed, and the stepson's like, Dad, aren't you going to say something? I love you. Good night. The stepson doesn't know what to do with that. Weeks and months go by. There's the trial. The, this boy is found guilty and pleads it down to uh, a lesser charge. So he only has to spend about three years in prison. And as often as possible, his father comes to visit him. His, his stepfather comes to visit him in the prison. And he's there and he's constantly there reminding him, I love you. I can't wait for you to come home. Finally, he comes home. Why? Why? Why are you doing this? Why, why are you so nice to me? Why are you so kind to me? I love you. I paid for your bail. I paid for your life. I paid for you. I love you. I care for you. Nothing else matters. See, that kind of love built on that relationship, that commitment. That's the kind of relationship your heavenly father has with you and wants to have with you. He loves you all the time. He sees you in the midst of your worst choices, your poorest mistakes, and he loves you anyway. He gives you directions, not because he hates you, but because he delivers you, because of his love for you, because he cares for you. And today he's calling you again. Therefore, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, your spiritual act of worship. Be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ has redeemed you. May the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, therefore guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Please rise for prayer. And as Pastor said, we will pray for Barrett, Polina, and also for Patty in our prayers this morning. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and, for, and of pardon. And with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need and for the hungry and the homeless, for the widowed and the orphaned, and for all those who are in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, for Patty, who's facing back surgery, and for Barrett Bellina, who was baptized in the, to the kingdom of God, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and in hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has called all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such ways hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you graciously give this day also sin and every evil. I will not feelings which I would please you. I am in your hands and commend myself, my body and soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. At this time, I invite you to take your communion cups out, but do not partake of them just yet. I'll instruct you when to do that in a moment or two. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And in the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks and blessed, he said, Take and drink of it. This blood is the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We'll continue with our next hymn.
back out, peel the foil back, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Flip it over, peel the foil back, take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do in remembrance of me. Please be seated. May this true body and blood strengthen you to life everlasting, keep you in one true faith. Depart in peace. Amen.
please rise? Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord and Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Again, good morning. Words of welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. Pray God has blessed you through our time together in worship today. Uh, your four announcements for today. First, I want you to mark your calendars for Palm Sunday, uh, Sunday, March 28th, which is the Journey to the Cross here at St. John. Uh, this will be a community invitation event. It's open for all families, congregations, school, church, child care, um, and anyone who lives in town or anywhere in the area. 
We're going to be offering the Journey to the Cross, which is a set of stations where you walk through um, and experience what Jesus walked through on uh, his last days during Holy Week, from uh, the palm processional to uh, tasting the vinegar that Jesus was uh, given to drink when he was on the cross, and and all those different things that uh, we see as we experience moving towards uh, the celebration of Easter. That's going to be on Palm Sunday from 4 to 6 is the journey to the cross. It ends with a meal over here in the parish hall. We're looking for volunteers. Talk to me or, or Mr. Whitney um, uh, afterwards or uh, anyone who's on the parish ed board. Parish ed is kind of going to be um, our board who's uh, working with that. So Lisa Ayersman's up here. She's on parish ed. Uh, talk to any of those people about journey to the cross. Our second announcement, again, a reminder about the uh, Janelle Miller Memorial Campership um, or for Camp Luther of Nebraska. If you would like to attend Camp Luther, we have some financial assistance available, applications available to contact in the office. Um, we'll get you set up with uh, that campership. Third announcement, Moms for Moms. Um, next Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, any moms from, you know, preschool, infant age, all the way through teen or adult moms, that's fine too. Anybody who's ever wanted to say, as long as you live under my roof, uh, moms get together, they have some time for just fellowship and encouragement as sisters in Christ sharing in the joys of the vocation of being a Christian mother. And so join that group, uh, just come on in to the child care next Saturday, nine o'clock. Uh, and then our fourth announcement is uh, the evangelism collection for this month, collecting for disaster relief kits. You can see in your bulletin and on the list there all the items that are necessary for a kit. You can donate a whole kit. That's wonderful. Get all the items, put them in the Ziploc bag, bring in the kit. If you can only donate a couple items, that's okay too. We can add those together with other um, parts of gifts to Orphan Grain Train and uh, work on completing kits for those who are responding to disasters anywhere around the world. So those human, kit, our human care kits for disaster relief come in handy. There's your four announcements. This is the Lord has blessed us with. May you enjoy your family and friends, and before we depart the worship space today, as you wait for your ushers, I invite you to spend a few moments in silent prayer, asking God to help lead you to uh, respond to his precious gift of forgiveness and that relationship he creates for you.